titled this morning's message, A Tale of Two Cities. I'm about to write, come over here to the board because I want to kind of like write, um, I want to write a couple of things up on the board. So I guess one thing that I would say is I'm just going to draw a big circle up here and I'm going to call this circle the, the plan of God. Okay, now there's a lot of different definitions that we could give to the plan of God. Anybody want to just be interactive a little bit since we, yeah, yeah let's get interactive. What's the plan of God back there that said, yeah, before you exit uh, stage? Uh, oh, what's, the, what's the plan of God in your verbiage? Oh, that's a good one. Not just, just not overthink it. Okay. Just, just give me some. The plan of God, uh, salvation. That's a good one. Salvation. salvation. To have a family. To have a family. Anybody else? Fix the problem uh, from the fall. Fix the problem from the fall. Yeah, That's good. I like all of those answers. The, but, but what we've all agreed on is that the plan of God, that God has a big plan, right? Yeah. And that part of that plan, some of the answers we got was uh, the, a family of God, salvation to fix the fall. And if you think about it, in reality, in some way, shape, or form, all three of those answers were actually interconnected, yeah. right? So what we see, though, I'm just saying, like, let's just pretend this is just a blank, empty slate of the plan of God. And you and I are kind of learning as we go more and more as individuals through his word, through the spirit. We're, we're, we're starting to see as time has gone by and we're able to read history and see the moves of the moving of humanity and the moving of God upon the earth. It's almost like the plan is becoming much more clear to human beings right. than what it ever was before. Right. And so within his plan, one big part of that plan was, let's just call it, let's just call it creation. Okay? So listen, what you need to understand is, is that this is the earth, this is creation. Upon this earth, there's a bunch of, there's at least one set of human beings now that are going to multiply and they're going to spread over the face of the earth. But this is just a piece of. Creation is just a piece, it, just, uh, it really starts off as almost like a blob of paint upon a portrait on the palette that he's painting, mm -hmm. right? I mean, creation is not the plan of God, yes, it's a huge part of the plan of God, but right. I kind of like, really, all those answers that were given, okay, I'm going to hold off on yours because I want to introduce it a little bit later, but between what... What Yvette said, family and salvation. Now, you don't need salvation until you enter into the problem, which is what my brother said back there, fix the problem. Right? right? So God made it created. So this is the power of God. I'm not a good artist, but I want you to get the point. There's a big old plan. And the big plan is ultimately he's going to have an eternal family. Right. Before the first man was ever created, that was in God's heart. God's heart was that there's going to be, he's going to turn the page on this temporal world that we live in. And when that is done, we're going to enter into a millennial reign of Christ. And then when that is done, there's going to be an eternity that we're going to spend in the presence of God. All right. But in the midst of this part of the creation that took place, there was also the introduction of the fall of man. Right. The enemy, Satan himself, came in, kind of slipped in the backside there. And we'll just kind of like paint this green just to make it a little bit different because the fall like yeast. Really? I mean, that's what that's why Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And he said, what are you talking about? Said, well, we thought that he was mad at us because we didn't bring any bread. No, he's talking about the doctrine of the Pharisees. That's just an example. Leaven or yeast, when you put a pinch of it in the dough, it begins to spread. Leaven is a type of sin in the Bible. And the sin of Adam and Eve was like yeast that spread throughout the entirety of the human race. So the entirety of the human race is in a fallen state, has been born with a fallen nature and therefore in their first birth they're born sinners so God had a plan and the plan was that he would send Jesus amen so he did he sent Jesus and I guess what we'll do is we'll go ahead and make this one light he sent Jesus upon the earth and now what we've been seeing for all of this time, now don't get me wrong, God's presence was already here. God's word was already here before Jesus even came. So there was an intermixing of the two even before, even before Jesus came, right? God had his, had his mouthpieces, the prophets, the nation of Israel, even the tabernacle by itself as we've been studying. It's all 
been relative to pointing the way that there's a God on earth that loves and he, there's a God on earth that has an answer for sin to fix the problem, to bring forth salvation. Okay, and this has always been God's plan. Now, but what I want you to understand is, is that based upon this, there's there's all kind of inner workings also that's taking place in the middle of here. What I'm trying to say is, is that if this is the corrupted world and this is the world that God has allowed that represents him, this portion of this world represents him. Some of this is flowing over here. Help me out here. Come on. Come on. Don't shout me down when I get to preaching. Good. <laughs> and some of this is right. going over here. Right. Well, right. what are you talking about, preacher? Well, you and I, what our purpose on this earth is not to be a millionaire, not to be drive the best car, not to be the best doctor, not to be the best nurse practitioner, not to be the best fitness trainer, not to be the best dog trainer, not to be the best <laughs> veterinarian. But instead to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, to make a choice to choose him as our Lord and Savior so that you and I can also become part of the eternal family of God. If that don't sit well with your theology, then I think you need to reread your Bible or you need to get you a different preacher. Because there's a whole lot of preaching out there that entices the flesh. Right. And tells me even popular books that would say, and I, I've been picking on a Joel Osteen's book, Your Best Life Now. I got a problem with that, church. You can have a problem with me if you want to. I'm okay with that this morning. Just the kind of mood I'm in. I will say this. I'm not okay with your best life now. If you're going to have your, your best life can never be experienced on this earth. This earth has fallen because of sin that has entered in. And there's a spirit behind all of this. Listen, we're going to get into that in a second. I'm going to use the scriptures to get into that in just a second to prove to you that there's something going on here. And we are actually seeing it before our very eyes in 2021 manifesting itself in such a way more clear than ever, ever before. It's been here from the get. It's been here from the get, from the beginning, from the fall of mankind, from the introduction of sin into the human race. It's been, but it's just been progressively, see, for many, 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 many thousands of years, it was slow in coming. Now it's shifted into overdrive and it's becoming more and more manifest. Well, so just the same way that the church infiltrates into the world, because you do realize you're supposed to bring Jesus outside of these right, walls. Right out there to a lost and a dying world. That is true Christianity, my friend. Most churches today, and I'm not picking on any specific church. I might pick on a couple of preachers this morning, but I'm not picking on any specific church. I'm not even picking on the people that are inside of the churches. You're either in or you're out. But I'm here to tell you, if you're in, true Christianity is that you will let your light shine before men and that it will glorify your Father in heaven. That is the words of Jesus. That is not my words. The Word of God teaches us again and again and again that we are to be witnesses to the change that Jesus has produced on the inside of our lives and hearts. See, you must be born again. And again, how are you born again? Through faith in Jesus Christ, by realizing that you're a sinner, by realizing that you needed a sacrifice for your sin, by realizing that the Father sent his son Jesus, paid the penalty for your sin, and that through faith in that, there's a transaction that takes place where he he takes upon himself your guilt and he transfers his righteousness over to you. Now you're right in the eyes of God based upon your faith in God's plan. That's God's plan. It's beautiful. You can't make it any better. Now, that's what you're supposed to share with those out there. Not, li listen to me, not my church. Oh, we got an Easter egg hunt with the community. You know, da-da-da, come on over. You know, it, it'd be one thing, too. I'm not over here picking on Easter egg hunts, but, you know, I, I got a lot I could say about that. The goddess Ishtar and the whole Babylonian goddess of fertility. I got, I got a lot I could say about that. Because, see, the problem that I have, and I wasn't really going to preach on this, but the problem that I have with Ishtar is that she's trying to steal the resurrection from my Jesus. Yeah. And the problem that I have with Santa, Satan's claws is that he's trying to steal the birth away from my Jesus. Hmm. Sorry. I'm just telling you the truth. Those are the problems that I have with these characters in my life. Right, right. I'm just put fed up to the point where I'm willing to say it. Amen. Now, it would be one thing if the unknowing pastor said, hey, the community, the mayor gave us the key to the city and we're hosting a Easter egg hunt and when you come and you get your Easter eggs, we're also going to tell you 
the good news about the fact that you're a sinner born yeah. in sin, but that God sent his yeah. son. You see, yeah. the problem with that, though, is, is that humanity in and of itself doesn't usually want to hear a message that's going to tell them that. Oh, but preacher, not everybody's got to say it the way you do. No, no it's got to be said. May not have to be said with my personality, but it has to be said. Yeah. See, nowadays in the dirt, and I'm telling you, there's a reason for this, and we're going to get into it. There's an atmosphere, a shifting or change that's taking place in the atmosphere of the church, right. to where, to where the the message is changing, the message is being diluted, the message is being softened, yeah. and the reason why is because there's been many movements that have infiltrated the church. But what I'm here to tell you is, is that this wasn't some new good idea that was birthed from God and given to the church. No, this was all slew foot, like Rolling Stone sang the song, Ode to Satan, I was there when Pontius Pilate washed his hands. Mm. He's been here a long time, my friend. He's been observing human behavior for a long time. He's been here long before the preacher that you listen to on TV. Don't think your preacher, don't think this preacher couldn't be deceived by the old goaded, the goat hoofed one. Okay? And so what he's doing is, is that he's infiltrating the church with these little plans. Mm. And these plans look oh so good. Because on the outside, they appear to be helping hurting humanity. Now we're going to get into that. They appear to be helping hurting humanity. How can it be wrong to help hurting humanity? Listen, I'm not saying that in and of itself it's wrong to help hurting humanity. Jesus said, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit them in prison. But listen, nowadays in the modern church, that is what has become the concept of what ministry really is. Mm. Social networking that helps the social community Social community outreaches that help those that are less fortunate. And I'm here to tell you that that is not the way that God birthed it. Yes, you should. The church, the, those that love, we should share what we have in order to help others. In order to help others hear the gospel. Right. But if we're over there, like one of my favorite preachers said, you can put a biscuit in his belly. But if you don't give him Jesus, he's going to be hungry again tomorrow. So I titled my message this morning, A Tale of Two Cities. And the reason why is that as we move forward, I want you to know that Satan has always had a plan to build a city that would reach into the heavens. You need to know that. Satan has a plan to build a city that reaches into the heavens. Ultimately, his plan is to reach where God is and overtake the throne of God. Oh, he already tried. Listen, one thing you got to understand about the enemy of your soul, he is never going to quit. I'm telling you, I'm not into dog fight, but if, I, if you had a dog that was in the dog fight, you want one with the spirit of the devil. <laughs> if, you had a, if you had an MMA fighter that you want, that you, I don't bet on MMA fights, but if you had an MMA fighter you wanted to bet on, you would want one that have the spirit of the devil. Because let me tell you something, he is like a rabid dog and he will never, ever, ever, ever Quit And just when you think that he gave you a break, oh, no, no. Just like it said when he was tempting Jesus, the devil left for a season. That's all he does. He leaves for a period of time and he regroups and he's watching. He's watching and he's taking notes. He's taking inventory of everything that's going on. I'm here to tell you the devil is a liar, a killer, a destroyer of human souls. And he is much more of a formidable foe than we have ever given him credit for. I'm not here to exalt the devil because in the end he is going to be destroyed. He is going to lose and he will burn in Gehenna, the last fire, the lake of fire, along with him and the prophet, the false prophet, and also the antichrist. They will burn for an eternity in a place where the Bible says the fire is not quenched, the worm doesn't die, and the smoke of their torment will rise up in the nostrils of God forever and ever and ever and ever. It's never, never, never going to stop. Now, I don't care what the Jehovah Witnesses tell you. That's a lie from the doctrines of devils. There is a hell. There is an eternal punishment. The Bible teaches it. But I want you to know while Satan's over there trying to build his own city that he's going to try to reach up into heaven. He's already been cast out, but listen, he's been way busy. At the same time, God is currently building a city that will reach down to man. See, there's the difference. Man's trying to reach up 
He really wants to make himself like God. Man's reaching down. Man, come, I'm sorry, God's reaching down. He's coming down with his holiness, with his righteousness to this God forsaken place that is void of him. And he's wanting his light to be shined so that you and I have an opportunity to know who he is. I believe that through the years, the church has spoken about the fact that there was coming a day when there would be an antichrist. Have you heard that since you were a kid? That there would be an antichrist revealed, that people would have to take a mark on their right hand or their forehead. Do y'all remember people talking about that? Listen, I mean, I can remember being 12 years old, going to the neighborhood store, already addicted to skull, and they let me buy my skull back then, 12 years old from the grocery store, going to get my can of dip, and people talking about, man, it's about the mark of the beast. I can remember them talking about it way back then. Mm -hmm. How long you been hearing about it, right? Mm -hmm. The point I'm trying to make, really, since I was a young kid, I've heard the terminology that we are in the last days. Now, I got to tell you, the truthfully, the last day started when Jesus came. But every day after that, we've gotten closer and closer. It is my opinion that now more than ever before, all these thoughts should be ringing loudly in our ears. You hear what I'm saying? I'm saying that all these thoughts about the end days, mark of the beast, antichrist, all, whatever the plan of the end is should be right now in our lives ringing loudly in our ears. What should we be doing about it? What you want me to do about it, preacher? It's just little old me. What, how you want me to fix it? This is what the answer should be. One, concerned with our personal walk with the Lord. And two, concerned with the spiritual well-being of others around us. Period. That's about what you can do, my friend. Yeah. You need, I need to make sure I'm getting and remaining close to the Lord. And then you need and I need as we're close to the Lord to allow that Jesus in us to spread to other people around us. That's God's will for your life, for my life. That's God's will for the church. Our hearts should desire to give the truth to the lost so they could be set free from their spiritual bondage. Like my brother said, so that their problem could be fixed. But the church has been lulled to sleep through the spirit of Antichrist. Hear me now. I'm telling you what I know. <laughs> not because I slept in the Holiday Inn Express last night. Not just because I read volumes and volumes of information. Because guess what? That in and of itself. But because it lines up with the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about this morning. We've been lulled to sleep by the spirit of Antichrist whose calming lullabies have changed the truth to a message that promotes a change towards a gospel that attempts to make social improvement. This movement is built upon deceit. It has led many people into thinking that this is the new Christianity and that God is all uh, always about all people feeling good and everyone crossing lines and just loving where we can agree, just love and helping everybody, man. You know, come on. It's just all about love. Don't don't judge them for the way that I could I mean here, dude, I ain't got enough time to judge you for the way you look. I ain't got enough time. I mean, I might mess with my daughter sometimes, like about whatever, or, or the other daughter about their clothes, but they mess with me and da da da. But I'm talking about like really, <laughs> dude, I ain't got time to worry about your genderosity. Not generosity, but your I just made up a word. Your gender right, dude. I ain't got time for that. I love everybody. Don't ask my opinion of what I believe because you might not like that. Right, right. But I'm just saying I ain't got nothing against you. Right. I'm done with that. I don't want to be no hater. I want to be a lover of the human heart. Yeah. Jesus is a lover of the human heart. But Jesus right. came to die on a cross to pay the penalty of sin. We've been trained under a spirit of fear to believe that we don't have a right to question anything if it's coming from the mouth of a preacher also. Hmm. See, then we're just supposed to accept it and say and, and not say anything. Because if we do, you know, we're, we're accused of touching the anointed. Come on. Oh, you can't question that. How dare you say this or that about this preacher? Because now you're touching the anointed. But God warns in his word that there will be false prophets in the end, just as there were false prophets in ancient times. Look at Matthew 7, 13 through 15. It says, enter ye in at the straight gate. So can I tell you what the straight gate means is that it's narrow. It's not wide. 
what this scripture is telling us is that ain't everybody that says they're going to make it is going to make it. Now, listen, I'm not the one to sit here and judge who's in and who's out. That's not my job. I'm just telling you what the word says. Where it says, enter in at the straight gate for wide is the gate. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there will be that go in that way. Because straight is the gate, narrow is the way which leads to life, and few there will be that find that. What is that telling you? What, what are you saying, preacher? You think less people are going to make it to heaven than the rest of the world is going to go to hell? I didn't, that's what the Word of God said. More people are going to go to hell than they're going to go to heaven. Because it leads to life, and few there be that find it. Look at verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. Point in, tack, in the context. Straight, narrow is the way. Few people are there going to be that find it. Broad, wide is the way that leads to destruction. That's where the majority of them are going. Oh, by the way, Beware of false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing. They look the part. They sound the part. They say all the right stuff, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Now we're talking New Testament time frame after Jesus has died, after he's resurrected, after he's ascended to the Father. And, the, and Peter writes to the church, Beware of false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily or secretly, that's the trick, secretly, they don't introduce lies out loud. On they don't. I don't know if they still use this term. They don't put their lies on blast. No, it's it's more like throwing shade. I think is the way it would. Just slowly, just kind of like leak it out there. Well, okay, well, that sounded like it might not have been exactly right. Oh well, it don't matter. I'm just busy. Let's just keep on moving. It looks like they're doing good. They gave cupcakes to the kids. They gave out some water. Look at that. Oh, they so sweet to everybody. Oh yeah, we we heading in the right direction. We're good. No, it's lies. They, they introduce their lies secretly. Now, I told you I was going to call a couple preachers out today, and I'm going to do it. Rick Warren, this particular quote comes out of a book that I had to read while I was getting my master's degree. It's called The Emerging Church. The Emerging Church is talking about all the changes that you and I now are seeing in the mega church movement. All right. This is what he said. When the disciples wanted to talk about prophecy, Jesus quickly switched the conversation to evangelism. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, that'd be all nice and dandy and pretty and sound just so good if Rick Warren's idea of evangelism was the same as yours. All right. He wanted them to concentrate on their mission in the world. He said, in essence, details of my return and none of your business. What is your business is the mission I have the, the mission I have given you. Focus on that. Well, first of all, Jesus ain't said really nothing like that. He did say it's not your for you to know the exact time and season. But what he did say, and he did say, go into all the world and preach the gospel. But how many times did he warn us? How many times did even Paul talk about be sober, be vigilant, that your adversary, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour? How important is it for us to understand the times and the seasons of which we are existing? Why would God give us prophecy? Why would he give us prophecy that point to a time in the future if he did not want us to study it? No, it's dangerous to follow after teachings like this. He goes on to say, because listen, he's the author of the secret sensitive movement, the mega church movement. And so he says, today seekers are hungry for symbols and metaphors and experiences and stories that reveal the greatness of God. Because seekers are constantly changing, we must be sensitive to them like Jesus was. We must be willing to meet them on their own turf and speak to them in ways they understand. Okay, I don't have a problem with speaking to people the way they, they understand. But how, and yeah, Jesus was sensitive with sinners, but did he shrink back from telling people the truth? Yeah. No, he told the Samaritan woman, go get your husband. Oh, I don't have one. Yeah, then she said, it's true, you've had five, and the one you're with now is not even your husband. Now, how sensitive is that? But guess what? The word of God hit 
her like a two by four. And what did she do? She ran back to the village and she told everybody in the village, you got to come see the one that knew everything about me. See, when the true gospel hits your heart and causes change on the inside of you, you now will become an oracle or a mouthpiece for God. You now will begin to tell the truth. Not some pie in the sky, community get self-help program that's going to tat tat everybody and make them all feel better. No, if you want the gospel to change you, you're going to have to come to grips with the reality of what the gospel says. We certainly have a job to do, which is to preach and teach the truth so that people get saved, so that disciples would be made, so that more people would be saved. But God's plan is not for us to improve society by making people's lives better. That, In other words... That's not the focal point of what we're to do in the gospel. This isn't a social engineering plan. But now listen to me. I want to make myself a little bit more clear when I explain this, and I'm going to get into it. And you can do your own, you can do your own research on this. As a matter of fact, I encourage you to take some notes and to do your own research. Especially like people on video, if I say something that irritates you, just to write it down and do the own research. Because I've done a lot of research. I have studied this a lot. Okay, but I just want you to know, I'm just going to introduce this man's name here, Peter Drucker. I couldn't remember his name for the longest time. And Peter Drucker's interconnection with Rick Warren. Now, when it's all said and done to me, see, none of this stuff happens on accident in my life. I'm telling you. If you're looking for answers and you're praying that the Lord would give them and you're willing to put in a little bit of time, you are going to find yourself... <laughs> Knee deep in information that you didn't necessarily expect you would find. Let me tell you the story real quick on Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker is a, was a prolific author in business. The first time I heard of Peter Drucker's name was when I was in nursing school and I was taking a business management class. What I remembered about Peter Drucker was a concept called TQM, Time Quality Management. He wrote over 40 books on that. In other words, there's always a better way to more proficiently accomplish a task. Organizations and businesses are always looking for a more effective way to accomplish a task. Makes sense? In the world of industry, makes perfect sense. I'm all about efficiency, proficiency. I'm all about getting the job done. Cut out the fat that we don't need and let's streamline it. Let's get it done fast. Makes sense. So how astonishing and how surprised was I to find out later on in some way, shape or form, Peter Drucker was interconnected with Rick Warren. As a matter of fact, Rick Warren gave the keynote speech at Peter Drucker's funeral. So then that to me was two worlds that collided, a world where I went to nursing school and did took business classes and learned about this man that was about time quality management, another world where I'm saved and in the church and now I'm starting to find out about this false gospel and this, these lies at the enemy and somehow these two worlds collide. And what, what does all this mean? What is, so I happened to find an interview on video, I suppose it's still out there, I haven't looked at it in a while, this was a few years back, where somebody was interviewing Peter Drucker before he died. He was like, I'm saying Swedish descent, but he was some kind of an Eastern European accent. And they asked him, so Mr. Drucker, you're a Christian. Oh no, absolutely not. Oh, well, what, well, what is it that, you, that you're doing? Oh no, you see, I tried to bring my plan to corporate America. But corporate America did not want to do what I wanted to do. Now, listen, I'm going to introduce you to an idea, and I want you to hold on to this because this is important for my message. It's called the spirit. I would accidentally put a dollar sign, but maybe that's not an accident. <laughs> the spirit of Babel. All right? We're going to get into that in a second, but I just want you to hold that thought in your mind. The spirit of Babel. I'm trying to tell you that's the spirit this man was operating on. I wanted to bring my ideas to corporate America. And in my ideas, we were going to help society. We were going to do social engineering and corporate America was going to help. But can I tell you a little secret? Corporate America is greedy, my friend. Corporate America is, I'm not saying they never, nobody ever gives to any kind of philanthropic part. Yeah, because they want some, they need some tax cuts. Give me a break, dude. When they're billionaires, they got to find a way to ease some of this tax burden, okay? So I'm not trying to say that no money never flows in any kind of theoretical social engineering concept. But he said, overall, they weren't buying in. 
hits the advent of the mega church. You can go do your own research. Listen to me. Do you realize what I just told you? I just told you that if there's any, any inkling of truth to this, that this whole mega church movement and everything that's interconnected to it is actually of a completely different spirit than the spirit of the Holy Spirit. I'm not trying to say that there's no good preacher in no big church. That's not, pre that's not what I'm trying to tell you. But what I am trying to tell you is that the institution known as the mega church that started with the Crystal Cathedral over there in California, all that is interconnected to new age occultism, spiritism, and the spirit behind us, and I said it, I said it, it's documented on, on video, is not of the Lord, it's of a spirit of another kind that's in direct opposition to the plan of God, and we are seeing all of this come full force and manifest itself in the day and age that we are living in. The biggest deceptions that the modern mega church movement has fostered, it looks good on the outside. See, that's why it's so hard. Even, even the quotes of, of Rick Warren, there was pieces of truth in there. Mm -hmm. See, I'd much rather a straight up lie. Just tell me a lie. I'll watch your eyes, how they twitch, oh. or whatever your mouth does. I'd rather you just tell me a straight up lie, but boy, when you start mixing it with truth, it becomes real muddied, it becomes real confusing. Pigs, people feel like they're part of something good, but I need you to understand that this is all part of an end times deception. You got, it, it, we're so naive in the church. I can remember one time, man, about 15 years ago, somebody's like, dude, Alice Cooper got saved, man. Alice Cooper, yeah, he got saved. And I'm like, wow, that's awesome, man. Yeah. Jesus saved anybody. Well, he can. Yeah. Jesus can save anybody. Jesus can certainly save Alice Cooper. Amen. Amen. Five years later, though, here he is in a music video with Kesha. Got pentagrams and blood flowing and all oh, this rock and roll. Say, sorry, dude, if you're saved. Oh, and then I read that interview, too. Well, I just believe that I can still um, express myself through my type of music. No, you're a liar, sir. You're a liar and you're a son of the devil. And what you're doing is you're deceiving naive believers, just like I've been naive all of my life when Ozzy Osbourne said back in the day, oh, I'm not a Satan worshiper. I have a beautiful child. How would God ever left no Satan? Oh, give me a break. Satan worshipers have kids all the time that are healthy. You, but when you said that in my naive little mind, I wanted to believe it because I still wanted to listen to your stupid Bay of Pig song or whatever. Yeah. Your fairies wear boots or your Iron Man or your stupid stuff that I was being convicted over. Mm -hmm. But it was still a part to me because I didn't like the fact that you named your, your band Black Sabbath and I believed your little lie. No, sir, you also are a child of the devil. Because if you get saved, you're coming out, my friend. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, no. The word of God says, come out from amongst them and be ye separate, says the Lord. What fellowship does light have with darkness? You can't have a little bit of this and a little bit of that intertwined because then you end up with this muddy mess and nobody really knows what's going on. That's part of the part of the plan of the evil one. Right. Mix it all up. Make it real confusing. Make people think that they're okay. Look at all this good stuff we're doing out here. I don't even have time to get into all that. How the forces of evil, literally, that's what the yin and the yang is all about, black and white, equal amounts of good and bad. Mm. That's how their magic works. Mm. I ain't even going there because I don't have time. But I want to read this to you. Now this, I read this whole woman's manifesto. She, her date of birth, she lived from June 16, 1880 to December 15, 1949. All right. I read her whole manifesto. By the time I was done reading that, I was like, oh, my gosh, I am so confused. Like, I, if I didn't know the things I know, I would have thought this woman was a woman of God. She was a self-professing Luciferian. She was a Lucifer worshiper. Listen to this small quote from Alice Bailey. Because it's all interconnected to the things we hear from the Rick Warren camp, from all that way of social engineering, all this stuff that's going on. Do what you want with it. Throw dust in the air. Pull your hair out. Oh, turn the channel. I don't know, but I'm just telling you. This is her. It is time that the church woke up to its true mission. This is a Lucifer worshiper throwing the word church out there. Who? What? How dare she? 
It is time that the church woke up to its true mission, which is to materialize the kingdom of God on earth today. Get some good socialization doing. Come on, reach out to the community. People are no longer interested in a possible heavenly state or a probable hell. They need to learn that the kingdom is here and must express itself on earth. The way into that kingdom is the way that Christ trod. Oh, look, it gets slippery. See, if you don't know any better, if you hadn't studied, you'd think, oh, you, you know, you'd be like, oh, man, she's talking about Jesus. She's talking about the church. All right. The way into that kingdom is the way that Christ trod. It involves the sacrifice of the personal self. Sounds kind of good, right? That the kingdom requires to sacrifice ourselves for the good of the world and the service of humanity. How is it signed? Occultist Alice Bailey. All right. So what I want you to know is, is that I read deep into her stuff. And some of her deeper writings, she begins to describe what she means by the word Christ. That's why I've done a very, tried very hard to teach the people that do come to this church what the word Christ means. Right. The word in the Greek literally means the anointed one. Yeah. Now, what she would teach is, is that there's been many Christs. And the word that they attach to them are the avatars. Y'all ever heard that word used before? The avatars is some weird stuff. Don't get into all that. I'm just, I did it for you. Just listen. The avatars, there's been many avatars, there's been many Christs. Jesus was just one of those Christs. The Buddha was a Christ. Jesus was a Christ. Multiple Christs that have walked upon the face of the earth, going around and doing good. So, the world is waiting for the Christ. See, the Muslims call him the Mahdi. The Jews are still waiting. We know that Jesus is coming back. But what he's going to be, the false one, before the real one comes, is the Antichrist. But the world is prepared and deceived and will not even know. The Bible tells us that they will be deceived and that he, God, will allow them to have what it was that they want. What did they want? They didn't want the truth. You can read that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The majority of the world did not want the truth. That's why so many people were susceptible to the deceptive lies that infiltrated and came into the church under this other spirit of deception. <laughs> Hear me again. She was a Luciferian and she is only a part of a movement that has been exist in existence for thousands of years. And I'm here to tell you that at all call, all that calls itself church is not the church. And all that calls itself Christian is not Christian. And I'll take it a step further. I believe that there are certain men and women who are not true believers and are very prominent preachers who have been planted to help. Now, that's a strong word, what I'm saying, but I'm telling you right now, this is what I believe. And if this is the time that you need to disconnect from me, then this is the time, but this is what I believe. That, that they create, they're purposeful. They've been planted in positions of high, or high authority to create an alternate movement of deception that is sucking people into a vacuum of lies and deceit. A great falling away is taking place before our very eyes and it's been so slow, so insidious that most people are blind or worse, they just don't care. They think it's all normal Christian. Oh, he's a preacher behind the pulpit and look, he said, so I said, Jesus. Oh, Lord Jesus. I'm about to get to that. I think I put it in here. Just because they say the name Jesus does not mean that they're true preachers of the gospel. Come on. We've got to read our Bible, right? right? City number one. You ready? City number one. Here we go. John chapter 14, verses one through four. I'm telling you, the name of this morning's message is a tale of two cities. Here's city number one, John 14, one through four. If you don't have your Bibles, let me read it for you. This is Jesus talking. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Let me change my little thing here. John chapter 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. 
Now, if you read on and you realize Thomas and some of the other disciples was like, how do we get there? We don't know what you're talking about. Oh, but you're going to know Thomas because as you follow Jesus to the end, you're going to see it real clear when they nail him on the cross and he resurrects. You're going to see the way. The way in order to be able to reach the destiny that Jesus is now preparing for you, preparing for me, preparing for Thomas and for all of the believers is through faith in his shed blood that kills the old man born of Adam, resurrects a new man in Christ and now you and I have access to eternal glory we have access to the eternal family we have access to eternal life and one day he's going to turn the page and when he does Revelation chapter 21 we're talking about the first city right here Revelation chapter 21 verses 1 through 4 he says I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. You see there? Jesus is working with the Father right now as we speak, and he's in, they're, they're building and preparing a holy city, that four-square city, that's going to one day be brought down from God. Just as God gave, brought Jesus down to this earth and allowed the light of God to begin to spread upon this earth, one day, after, as the Bible says it, when the time is right, there's going to be a holy city that's going to come down from God to earth, the new heavens and the new earth. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. Look at this. Boy, doesn't this encourage you? Have you ever shed a tear? I'm sure you have. Have you ever felt pain? I'm sure you have. We all have, right? God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Listen, I want to encourage you this morning to know this, that as long as we're on this fallen earth, before this new city makes it here, there's going to still be pain, sorrow, and tears. Now listen, the God that I serve, I know this, he will give you grace that you need to make it through the situations and the circumstances that you're facing in your life. Yes. You're, going to learn to, you're going to have to learn to hold on to him. There, there's not another way. It's, it's like learning the process of faith. I trust in you, Jesus, that what you did at the cross not only saves me, but gives me access to grace. I'm going through a trial, Lord. I need your presence. And listen, I'm here to tell you that there's going to be good days and there's going to be bad days. I'm, I'm one of these guys. I usually I'm the eternal optimist. But guess what? Sometimes just days are tough. Right. My best life ain't going to be now. My best life is going to be on the front, on the back end. Amen. 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 I'm believing that. I got an inheritance that's waiting for me. The Apostle Paul prayed for the Ephesian church. I prayed to the Lord that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that you would know the hope of his calling in the inheritance of the saints. We need our eyes, spiritual eyes, open to that truth. Amen. Yes. From the first two passages that we read, we realize that Jesus is in heaven preparing a place for the children of God. Those that will choose to serve him today on earth will live with him for eternity in the new heaven and new earth. When we add another passage from Revelation, we can see that God's plan is designed to include all people from all over the world. Look at Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. Look at this scripture. And they sung a new song. Saying, you are worthy. They're singing it to the Lamb. You are worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. Why? For you were slain. Amen. And you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred. You know what a kindred? That comes from the word kind. And the word kind comes from kin. From every kinfolk. Every clan of people. From every kindred and tongue and people and nation. God's plan, listen, was always that a family would be created from over all the face of the earth. Let's take a look real quick. We have to understand, though, that every time God says something, the enemy is quick to produce a counterfeit, an alternative. 
Let's look right here. We have the luxury of knowing this part of God's work, right? That his plan was to redeem all of humanity. And we can take this concept backwards and when we can realize what God was doing so, so long ago. Look at Genesis chapter 9, verse 1. This is what the Lord told Noah after the flood, after the earth has been cleansed from all the Nephilim and all the black magic. We don't even have time to get into that. All the occultic, horrible activity that was taking place upon the earth where man's thoughts were wicked before the Lord day and night. Night and day, there was nothing good left on the earth except Noah and his lineage. God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. The word replenish is oftentimes translated as fill or fulfill. The word earth in this idea in Hebrew literally means the whole earth as opposed to a part of the earth. So God told Noah, Okay. Okay, son, the, the, the flood's over, the waters have receded, come on out of the boat, and this is my dictate to you, my mandate to you. I need you to begin to travel over the face of this earth, and I need you to repopulate this earth, I need you to replenish this earth. You and I have the luxury to look backwards now, and we realize why, because he wanted to redeem mankind out of every tongue, kindred, and nation. Because that's God's plan. That's God's plan. There's some other things that have been interposed on there, but that's God's plan. To create an eternal family from people out of China, India, Amen. Iran, South America. He, God is creating an eternal family. God's intent after the cleansing of the earth was that this earth would be replenished. But I have to tell you that the tale of two cities is a story of two plans. Whereas one is a city made by God and is God reaching down to man with his holiness and righteousness and hope. The other is a story of man through the spirits of darkness creating an alternate pathway of deception to prevent human beings from able to access eternal glory. And you can rest assured that every time in God's word that God would pronounce a part of his plan, Satan is waiting in the shadows to create an alternate pathway, adjust a new course where man in his own strength and the strength of darkness. But most importantly, this is what I want you to see here. Without God, man, without God in his society. Oh, no, he might use the name of God. But if you're. If you use the name of God, but your plan is contrary to the plan of God, you are doing nothing but deceiving. Have you ever met somebody like that before? No, really. People in the world. Like, I'm telling you, I see people like this sometimes. I'm just like, I ain't even believing this. Just telling me this big old, whole, long, drawn out, elaborate story with all these little pieces of puzzles of information. And I'm thinking to myself, dude, all that was an embellished lie where, where little pieces of truth mixed with lies was put in there purposefully to throw me off track. Right. Dude, that was a lot of effort. Right. A lot of effort. And that's just one little person in my little life. <laughs> Whoever that person may be that put all that effort into there. Dude, you've been lying so long. You like you truly like your father the devil. <laughs> it's been so long since you told the truth. You don't even know how to talk that way anymore. Man, there's, a, right. there's another yeah. way to talk. It's yeah. another language. It's yeah. called truth. Wow. Yeah. <sighs> So without God, man without God builds his own city in an attempt to get to heaven. We're about to get to that. In one city, God comes down to man. In the other city, man tries to get up there, wherever there is. But it's not God's way. It's not God's plan. I don't care how good it looks. If it's not God's way, it's not God. If it's not God's way, it's produced by Satan. And it's up to you to figure out. Whether or not all these little intricate details of the churches that you listen to and the stuff you follow and all that, that's on you. I'm, just, I'm telling you what I've studied. I wouldn't say this on national television if it wasn't, if I didn't believe it to be true. All 13 of you out there. It's not God's way. It's not God's plan. I don't care how good it looks. So we need to understand what these two cities represent. Two systems that are concurrently growing Side by side, two systems. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of Antichrist. A system of God, I'll call this the beast system. That's what I've been calling it lately. It just works for me, the way that I've studied it. The beast system. Can I tell you that the beast system has been on this earth since day one? <laughs> Even Listen, the beast system in 
the devil himself just ready to inject a human being with his poison so that he could begin to manufacture his own alternate pathway, his own plan. And it's been growing through the ages. And the Bible has scripture to show us that it's been here. But let's look at city number two. Because city number one, remember, Jesus said, let your heart not be troubled. I go away to my father's house. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not tell you. But I go away to prepare a place for you. And if I go away, it means I'm coming back again. And one day that that place is coming down to us. But city number two is this. Genesis chapter eight. I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 10, starting with verse 8. Now, I got to tell you, when the Lord first started getting a hold of me, I'm talking about, listen, when the Lord, let's just try to give you a quick story. And, and those of you that know me, maybe it'll mean something. If you don't know me, then you're just going to have to like try to figure out whether there's enough here for you to try to study it yourself. When the Lord first started getting a hold of me, what he was teaching me was what it meant to be in Christ. Right. Right? Yeah. But at the same time that I was getting a revelation of that, when my eyes lit upon Genesis chapter 11, the Holy Spirit became so loud in my spirit, man, and started telling me, you need to know this. You need to understand this. And I'm going to tell you, I tried. I mean, it was really kind of like right when the Internet was coming out and I just barely even knew how to use the Internet. And I tried as best I could to understand with the little bit of resources I had at the time. And then after a while, I kind of gave up. But then many, many years later, all of a sudden, things started falling into place. And I started. And so I believe that I understand now what God was telling me he wanted me to understand. And I'm about to share with you what I believe that God was wanting me to understand. And it's going to be up to you, whether you be on video or in the sanctuary, on whether or not you can buy into what I'm trying to say. And if it's worth it to you, maybe to do some of your own research. All right. So, but, but what I'm going to do is build this out of the Bible. All right. All right? So let's look at Genesis chapter 10, verses 8 through 10. This is talking about the table of nations. This is after God told Noah to replenish the earth. And we get to one family group and it says, and Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. Now, a couple of things real quick just to point out. I know that I don't have a whole lot more room on the board, but let me just go ahead and erase some of this because I want you just to see a little bit of a picture of where this all kind of occurred, this land of Nimrod. Now, you got to understand that whenever this takes place, this is before there's ever a nation called Israel, okay? And so this is the Mediterranean Sea, and this is the what you would call the uh, western border of Israel. And so this is the, you know, the... Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea. Then there's these two rivers over here, the Tigris and the Euphrates. And then all this up here was actually known as Nineveh. If you were going to ask what was Nimrod's land, it was all this area. I would say all this area here. He started to build up all this area here. In much of my research of trying to figure out things connected to the Tower of Babel, my understanding is that it probably would have been located somewhere in this area here. Abraham was born in a place called Ur of the Chaldees. When you turn the page from Genesis 11 to Genesis 12, you see Abraham. It is believed by scholars and time frame people that Abraham would have seen the Tower of Babel. Abraham would have, everybody knew the Tower of Babel. It was there. Okay, I like this, and there's writings that state Alexander the Great wrote about the Tower. Okay, so the Tower of Babel was well known. It's probably still there. The remnants of it are probably still there. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure you can go to the right place at the right time and they'll tell you that we really believe this right here is the Tower of Babel. All right, so what I wanted you to see, though, is that first, first thing that I want you to know is about this man named Nimrod. His name literally means rebellion. So God's mandate to Noah was replenish the earth but Nimrod's name is says rebellion. What I want you to know about the word Babel right there is that in the Hebrew, the word Babel means confusion. Okay? Because God confused the languages that day. 
Now, I'm not really going to break down a whole lot about communication and how whatever this plan was, God really, that's what he did. He stopped their communication is what he did. And I'm not going to talk about how superior our communication situation is today. But I will point out to you that that is one thing that I definitely felt like the Lord put on my heart is that the way communication has increased over the last 50 years and that we're getting closer and closer to something that's happening. But that's just another story. All right. So in Hebrew, Babel means confusion. But in the original language that this whole concept would have been done, it was in the Akkadian language. That word right there actually means gate of God. Now, I'm not trying to get all confusion on you, but I do want to make a point. Gate of God. Babel. Gate El God. All right? So, what we're seeing here, that, that's just some of the preliminary information that I want to give you. This tower was being built in this city that we call Babel, which was actually ancient Babylon. Now, you got to go, you got to understand something. This is a city called Babylon. This is before the empire of Babylon. This is what you know that back in these times, these, pla these places in ancient times were known as city-states. So the Babylonian Empire comes much later. We're talking five, six hundred, you know, or well, we don't even really know that put a time frame on the Tower of Babel. But we're talking the Babylonian Empire somewhere around five to six hundred B.C. All right. But it's not the same thing. I just need you. To, I need you to understand that. All right. But it is where it got its name. All right, now let's look at Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. And let's see what this, re this rebellier, rebeller, what his plan was. This is after God said, replenish the earth. And the whole earth was, was of one language and of one speech. Now, I know I'm not reading too much into this, and you can do your own research on this too, but that word one, you know what it means? It means to be united. So what we have right here is a united nation. Now, you do what you want with that. But I've seen it before with my own eyes. They have built buildings in Eastern Europe that mimic paintings of the Tower of Babel. There have, there have been times for the United Nations, whenever they had conferences, where they used a Tower of Babel painting in the background. Many nations, one voice. Mm -hmm. Do what you want with that. The whole earth was of one language and of one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city. See, there's a city. There's one city that's coming down from God to man, but now there's a city being built by man in opposition to God. God said, replenish the earth. Nimrod said, no, let's rebel. Let's make brick. Let's bake them. Let's make ourselves a tower. Let's make ourselves a city. Let us make ourselves a name. Why do we want to do this? Lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Who cares what God says? We got our own plan here. See, this is mankind's ingenuity outside of God. God's not in this. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men build. And the Lord said, Behold, the people are one, united, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there upon the face of the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from there did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth. Now, if you're anything like me and you think much, the first thing I noticed when the Lord said, Matt, you need to understand this. The first problem I had was if the Bible is something that's to be believed. And now listen, I'm not, I'm not one of these guys that picks and chooses what I'm going to believe. I believe right. every last bit on right. every page. I may not always understand it. But God's called me to be a thinker. I know for a fact that God was not concerned with ancient man baking brittle bricks and trying to make some kind of a skyscraper that was going to actually touch him in his throne up there. And so he was nervous. Come on, man. Help me out here. No. 
When you begin to understand and you begin to study the concept of a tower, the word tower is used. And I've done extensive research on this whole topic, but I can tell you that all over the world, there are similar type structures known as pyramids or ziggurats on almost every continent. Maybe not Antarctica, but even on the Australian continent, there's a form of a, there's, they're, they're, in, they're in Asia. South America, oh my gosh, South America with this, I think it's called the Serpent Pyramid. The, the ancient technology, the mathematics that were used to build that under the Mayan Indians and the thousands and thousands of human remains that were found there. Look, dude, we're talking about a whole nother level. The Bible didn't tell us what they were doing, but it said, let us reach into heaven. And really that word heaven right there is talking about the celestial bodies literally in the Hebrew if you click on it or you go to it in a strong Hebrew concordance that word heaven says celestial bodies astrologers extra biblical evidence that you read will tell you that Nimrod and this kingdom started the whole concept of occult worship through the worshiping of the stars and the movements of the planetary bodies Many people will, will tell you that when it says God scattered the stars in the sky, that the actual stars told the message of creation, told the message of salvation. All of that was written there, but the enemy over there perverted it, tried to overtake it. And within all of that, this concept of astrology. So now what we're talking about is that this tower reaching into heaven. We're not talking about making it to the throne room of God. We're talking about hitting that realm where those fallen angels and those demon spirits live. We're talking about accessing that gate of the gods. We're talking about, we're talking about doing black magic and being able to become a medium to hear the voices of demon spirits and fallen angels. Why? Because there's a plan. There's a plan on the earth that is existing concurrently with the plan of God. And what better way to cause confusion than for this to one day creep into the church? So I want you to know that this city, understand that this city is called Babylon. That's where the, in the, in the, in the Hebrew it means confusion. But one of the other definitions of Babel is that it, it's where we get the word Babylon. But, but I need you to understand something. This is real important right here. This is not just a city or an empire called Babylon that must be rebuilt before the final days on earth will be accomplished. Listen, Saddam Hussein rebuilt the gate to Ishtar and it's beautiful, but it's the only thing there. If you're waiting for the city of Babylon, literal Babylon, to be rebuilt before the end day comes, dude, you're going to be over there. I'm, <laughs> forgive me, but you're going to be scratching your backside and scratching your head and the whole thing's going to happen and you're going to not even be aware it's happening. Because listen to me, I can't make it any more clear than what I can make it right here. We're not talking about a physical Babylon right now. Right. I'm about to show you. In the scriptures, this city that we're talking about that is still in existence. Yes, they were trying to build a physical city. Yes, they were. They built a physical tower. Yes, through that tower, they entered into a cult worship, just like they did in Egypt, just like they did in South America, just like they continue to do today. But that physical city is not where it stopped. It continued on through the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of Babel is a specific aspect of that spirit of Antichrist that is moving upon the earth in order to get the enemy's agenda forth. Do you realize that there's people that serve the enemy and they're a lot more faithful than most people in the church? What we need to understand about this is that these were spots of occultic worship, all these towers. The main idea from this passage is that the makers of this tower were attempting to engage the heavenly realm where the powers of darkness and principalities of wickedness are located. Again, heaven, even the word here describes these celestial bodies, Saturn, Venus, sun, moon, stars. In addition, the specific word astrology is used to describe this word right here in Genesis chapter 11. So we see even within the just the use of the word, the truth of this whole story being interconnected to magic. But further, extra biblical study reveals that Nimrod and the Tower were all the beginnings of this occultism form of worship. That word name, reputation, fame, glory, individually, on, that individuality, honor, authority. I want my own authority. I want my own honor. I don't want to do what it is that God wants me to do. Instead, I want to create and do and do and to rebel. 
It must be understood. Their desire was to build a name for themselves. The spirit of man corrupted by sin wants to have his own authority, his own glory, his own honor. Same thing the devil did. Same exact thing the devil did. Filled with pride, attempted to exalt himself above the throne of God, but he was cast down. Now he injects that sinful nature, that poison inside man and un left unchecked. Listen to me, even in your individual life, you cannot leave pride and bitterness unchecked in your heart or else it will begin to destroy you and tear you down that from the inside out. But on a, on a grand scale, he wants people that are willing to build their own kingdom. Look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 3. Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God, and this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Spirit of Antichrist has been in the world. The spirit of Antichrist does, will not say that Jesus came in the flesh. You know why? Because like Alice Bailey, they still wait for their Christ. All those that are not of the Lord are waiting for their Christ. Whether they realize it or not, many people are just collateral damage and they're just caught up in the mess. They're just ignorant. Look at Psalm chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Psalm 2. See, what I'm talking about is, is that the scriptures explain to us that this stuff has been going on. Why do the heathen rage? Who's a heathen? A person that doesn't know God. Specifically in the Old Testament, all those Old Testament countries... Canaanites, Egyptians, Babylonians, all those Old Testament countries that didn't know God. Why do the unbelievers rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves. You know what? You know what? I get an idea there. If you ever played football, when I was young, play football. Ready? Set. So you set yourself. You get in your stance. You were ready for impact. You were ready for a collision. Right. The, the kings of the earth set themselves. They're in a, they're in a fighting position. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. And this is what they say. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. What are, what are you trying to say, preacher? I'm trying to say that there's a spirit of Antichrist upon the earth, that there's a spirit of Babel upon the earth, that it's a spirit of rebellion against God's plan, and that the, that leadership and kings of nations have been involved in this plan, and that the heart of man outside of God wants to cast himself away from the control. That's what he feels like. He feels like man is God is controlling him. God's not controlling him. God has a plan for his life. God's plan is a good plan. He, he's paved a way to that would lead us to, uh, to a life of prosperity, that would lead us to a life of eternity with him, to a life of comfort. But the heart of man under the influence of darkness is being routed in another direction. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. Ephesians 2, verse 2 says this, when in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. You see that? I just, what I'm just trying to show you is that there's a spirit in the air. You, you see what this is? Spirit of Antichrist, spirit of Babel, spirit of, the, of the, the, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that works in the children of disobedience. From these scriptures, I really just wanted to make the point that the spirit of Antichrist has been on the face of the earth and inciting the rebellion of man against God. I will also make you aware that there is a specific aspect of the spirit of Antichrist that I call the spirit of Babel. It's the same spirit as the spirit of Antichrist, but it's a very deceptive element of the spirit of Antichrist's work. And it feels very comfortable and it operates very well within the walls of the church. It's man unified and man helping man. See, it looks good. It looks so good because man's helping man. But it's not the plan of God. And it's going to be your job if you care enough to try to figure it out on whether or not you're seeing that somewhere. Now, I'm not going to sit here and nitpick at the part. I know it's there. I'm convinced of it. And I'm going to be honest with you. When I hear it, I know it. And I'm turning the channel. I ain't got no time to monkey around with all that. I know that there's a real Jesus. I know that there's a real way. And I want to spend my time following after that. Man unified and man helping man is so deceptive because it looks good. What could be wrong with feeding the hungry? What could be wrong with taking care of sick children? But what we must understand is that man has been building a society that excludes God and God's way. Yeah. 
The devil transforms himself as an angel of light. I don't even have time to get there. Although, no, I really, maybe we should. Sorry. Because this is kind of important. I, I thought that this was interesting. I know that the Lord showed me this before. But I, but I want you to see this. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, what, I want to, what I'm going to show you first is verse 14. Okay, because what that says is, no, don't, don't marvel. Don't be confused. Don't be astonished. Satan himself tra is transformed into an angel of light. So if he wants to, he can transform himself into an angel of light. And you wouldn't have known no better. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, those that serve him, uh, also be transformed in as ministers of righteousness. Oh, see, so don't give me none of that garbage anymore about touch not the anointed of the Lord. No, it's my job as a child of God, as a preacher of the gospel, to pay attention to what people are saying, to what people are espousing, knowing that there's a spirit of Antichrist, knowing that there's a spirit of Babel, trying to infiltrate the kingdom of God, the plan of God, and to cause deception, and to cause people to go in a wrong direction. No, sir, no, man. It's my job to question these people and the words that they're using. And if you choose to be blind and ignorant of it, then that's on you, whoever you are. There's no great thing if the ministers, let me say it again, be transformed as ministers of righteousness. In other words, they're from the evil one, but they're dressed up and they're pretending. Back in the day, whenever Sierra was in school, they had skaters and posers. Back whenever I was in school, they had cowboys and kickers. One was the real thing, and the other one was just a play thing. Posing. And so what I'm trying to say is, is that they got preachers like that. They're posing. They're not the real thing. Do they really know they're not the real thing? I don't know, and I don't have time to figure that out either. They're either telling the truth or they're not. Right, right. Whose end shall be their worst. But listen, I want you to see this. See, he brought that up because this is where he's coming on the back end of this. This is 2 Corinthians eleven four. 4. For if he, who's he? A preacher. Comes preaching another Jesus. They got the name Jesus in their message. Whom, you have not, whom we have not preached. They preached Jesus, but it ain't the Jesus we're talking about. It's the Jesus of Alice Bailey. I don't know. Whom we have not preached or we receive another spirit. It's got a spirit connected to it. You can get the three zones. That the goosebumps, that don't mean that that's the Holy Ghost. Which you have not received or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. In other words, just because they got Jesus in their message and just because you get the free souls does not mean that it's the word of the Lord. Real quick, 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1. Because I'm warning you, we already knew it was coming, Right? 1 Timothy 4, 1. Now the Spirit expressly, the Spirit speaks expressly. So this isn't Matt. This isn't Angie. This isn't Naya. This isn't your favorite preacher. This is the Spirit. Expressly speaks. In the latter times. Do you think you're in the latter times? Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils. We've been warned. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. It says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust. See, people have lust, desires. That's what the word epithumia means. It means a desire. Sometimes it's good things, sometimes it's bad things. But people have desires in their belly. And they will go and put up with whatever is going to feed that desire that they have. And so if you're going into the church or hearing a preaching that is contrary to what it is that you want to perceive as life... It's, you're not going to like that. And you, what you're going to do is you're going to find you another preacher and you're going to put him on the pile. I like that when I put him there. I like that when I, it's almost like an inbox or some kind of computer thing. Okay, then put that preacher there, that preacher there, that preacher there, that preacher. All these preachers tell me this stuff because really the word itchy ear means pleasant words. They tell me words I like to hear. The point to all these scriptures is to drive home the thought that this spirit of Antichrist has been leading the enterprise of building its own city an opposition of God and hasn't only been affecting the world. No, it's also infiltrated the church. Remember the city of Babel was a variant of where the word Babylon came from. This is a point that I want to make in closing. Actual Babylon, I know I've already said it, but actual Babylon doesn't have to be rebuilt for any purpose. That's not even what this is talking about. Mystery Babylon 
And the building of this city has been an ongoing enterprise of Satan through the years of getting mankind to partner with him in order to build this system. You understand what I'm saying? I want you to view the system as though it were a city. That city that they had started building in the physical, it's like a system that they've been building through the years. Look at Revelation 17, 5. You ready? Revelation 17, 5. It says this, Upon her forehead was written, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. That's this city. This is how I see this as this city. Look at it. Well, well, you can see whatever you want, preacher, but what else you got to back it up? Well, this is what I'm going to close with right here. Revelation 18, 1 and 10. I want you to understand real quick because I didn't have, I just barely touched the surface. But what I want you to know what this system is made of, and it goes back to the Tower of Babel. It's made up of a religious, a counterfeit religious system. It's made up of a one world government. Tower of Babel, city, let us not scatter, but let us come together. And it's ultimately also made up of a one world or a financial system. Now, this financial system is already in existence. And we're seeing it being ramped up more and more and more. If you do any kind of research on the stock market or anything like that, I'm just saying you can start looking into digital identification, blockchain technology, artificial intelligence, all these cryptocurrency, all these things are just, it's just ha it's happening right before our very eyes. All the technology that's needed in order for that. To, now, when is it going to happen? I'm not going to sit. I, that's not what I do. I'm just telling you we need to be able to observe the signs because this is, it's written here. What we're seeing and what we're living in is written in the word of God. Look at Revelation 18, 1 through 10. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. He cried mightily with a vo strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, and is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils. What I'm trying to tell you is there ain't no city called Babylon that needs to be rebuilt and be big in order to be destroyed to fulfill this. Babylon, that city, is already in existence. And the hold of every foul spirit and cage of every unclean and hateful bird for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you. Double unto her, double according to her works. And the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. How much she has glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow. Give her, for she says in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine. She shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judges her and the kings of the earth who have committed fornication. I'm telling you, it's going on right now. Who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament her when they shall see the smoke of her burning standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that almighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. I just want to close with this. We're going to say a prayer, but I just, the main is, essence of what I was trying to communicate this morning is that there's another system. And I know that we know it, but it's much more organized than what we ever gave it credit for. And it's very deceiving. And it has infiltrated the church. And I just want to encourage all believers that would watch this to be careful about who you connect yourself to, to be careful about who you allow to speak into your life. And please, Ask the Lord to give you a hunger and a thirst for the word of God. And I pray right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, for everyone that would listen to this message, Lord, and really for the church as a whole, that you would lead and guide by your spirit, that you would draw people into your presence, and that you would give them a spirit of discernment, that they would be able to know and to tell when the truth of your word is going forth. Lord, not just pieces of truth, but the whole truth and nothing but the truth. 
I pray, Lord God, that you would give us all as your children a spirit of discernment, that we would be able to know, Lord, what spirit those people, whoever they may be, are operating in. We give you glory and honor, and we pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus, come. In Jesus' name, amen.